This one goes out to the one I love. Good evening. How are you? It's Tuesday night from 1FM. Hello, this is uh, Nicky Horn for Nicky Campbell, because uh, Nicky's doing Steve Wright at the moment, while Steve does his stuff uh, on the roadshow. And a fascinating programme lined up for you this evening. Um, with my special guest after the half past ten news will be uh, an old friend, uh, Dave Gilmore, who's uh, popped in to uh, talk to us about Pink Floyd and uh, other stuff. And he's actually in the uh, control room next door at the moment because he's brought in some Pink Floyd memorabilia and uh, various tapes and demos and stuff like that, which uh, we're now dubbing off DAT. And if you're a fan of the Pink Floyd, then I can promise you a real treat. Uh, Dave Gilmore, live here in the studio after the news at half past ten, with some Pink Floyd memorabilia never before heard on any radio station anywhere in the world. It's the news um, is two minutes, so that's good O-level math for you. Uh, my special guest live in the studio will be Dave Gilmore. In fact, I'm going to be very generous and let you say good evening now because you're just sitting here enjoying the music. I certainly am. Good evening, Nick. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely. How on earth did Genesis manage to get, some, get themselves banned on, on top of the pops? Fantastic. Um, what an achievement. They must be thrilled. Have you lot ever been banned? Absolutely. Constantly, yeah. Right. Well, we shall well, talk about that. No. Arnold, Arnold Lane was banned anyway. Was he? That was yeah, the day before. Because it was about transvestites. Well, we're going to talk about all that stuff Shock and all the other probe. stuff that you brought in. Uh, demos that have never before been heard on any radio station anywhere in the world. Come on, do get on with it. Oh, okay, on. I'll get on with it. Okay. Can I tear you away from your paper? Yeah, sorry. <coughs> right. this, we've got to be professional about this. Okay. Oh You're listening oh to BBC Radio 1 FM. This is Nicky Horn with Into the Night. For Nicky Campbell and my special guest tonight is the uh, geezer playing guitar there, none other than Dave Gilmore. Good little tune, I suppose that was Pink Floyd's greatest hing single hit, wasn't it? It certainly was, yes. Did rather well. Turned us up into the, the decade of the 80s, from the 70s into the 80s at number one. That was very nice, really. What was it like hearing that again? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? it I like does all the, there's good. lots of little bits that fit together very well. All the rhythm guitars and all that sort of stuff that us musicians listen for. A good fun. Well, it's, it's really a delight to see you here, because, I mean, I just sort of called you a few weeks ago on the off chance that you were going to come in. And um, I was, I was Lord, I've forgotten to have my phone number changed. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was wonderful when you said, yeah, I'd love to come in. You brought some, um, some really interesting things with you, which we'll talk about in a minute. In fact, we're going to play something in a few minutes, which uh, has never before been heard. But let's just talk now about sort of Pink Floyd current, and we'll get that out of the way, and then we'll sort of talk about all other stuff. Because the reason I originally called you, um, if you remember, was that I heard this rumour, it was in Q magazine or somewhere, that uh, the Floyd were doing a new album and that you were in the studio and there was going to be a follow-up to Momentary Lapse of Reason. And I rang up to say, what's the real story? And you said to me... What did I say? I said, I think it's probably a well, rumour put about by the management to try and persuade us to get into the studio, but it hasn't happened yet. We well, haven't started yet, but we're thinking about it. One of these, one of these days, maybe September, October, we'll trundle down to the studio and have a listen to a few old bits and pieces that we've got lying around and... Because what you said to me on the phone actually was unbroadcastable when I said that, but... Um, was it? About the new album, yes. Well, it's a good thing I don't remember, isn't it? <laughs> so, no now, new... as we're on live yes, radio and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, no. Have you got the no... seven-second delay going? No, 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 we don't have... No, we're... Great. Grown-ups. Grown-ups yeah. here. But I do have a fader. I'm glad you are. Um, see, I've just faded you out. Um, so, no Floyd, Pink Floyd album this year... And probably not to the end of next year, is that? The end of uh, late next year, I think, is as early as one can, can, can hope for, as I've still got to write it and rehearse it and record it and do all that sort of You're stuff. You're not sort of the most prolific band or writer in the world, are you? I mean, you don't do a lot of stuff. You, you like doing long holidays and flying your various aircraft, which... Uh, We'll yeah. talk about a little later because you've got a couple of war planes, uh, right. jets that you fly. I mean, um, you you kind of like the easy life, really. I, I mean, like. Do people have to? Do you actually have to get dragged into the studio when the manager says, "Come on"? Well, I think um, I have an enthusiasm for it that sort of builds up slowly as as you start working, and I become a workaholic when I'm working, but um, I don't have any particular sort of thing that drags me back there very, very quickly after finishing a project. And I have to say that the last uh, project that we did did take uh, about four years and it was very, very um, uh, 
draining in the end. Although it was fantastic fun, wouldn't regret a minute of it. But uh, it, it's you know, a couple of years off, off after that at uh, my ripe old age is is <laughs> not too bad. You're what, 42? Six, darling. 46. 46. Mm. Oh, well. It's because you've been away and you have a tan. Right, let's talk about um, some of the stuff that you brought in, because uh, these are real treats. I mean, some of these uh, have never... Well, in fact, none of these have been heard before. I've heard just one little bit that we'll mm. talk about later from Dark Side of the Moon. But you've brought, talking of Dark Side of the Moon, um, the demo of Money. Yes. Which we're about to play. So tell us um, the circumstances of this. Well, I can't really remember much about it, to be honest with you, Nick. I just, That's useful, I just, Dave. Very, very useful. I just found the tape while I was playing through some old stuff, and I t turned it on. I thought, "That's fun. Nicky would like to hear that, and the punters would like to hear that." And um, and it's Roger. Doing it's Roger. It. Roger playing um, a double-tracked acoustic guitar and singing "Money" over the top, um, so way, way, way back. So this is presumably, I mean, he wrote this, he brought it to the studio and said, this is the demo of money, we're going to now embellish it and put it on. What Let's would have it? a go at it, I should think he said, but I, have, I can't remember his exact words. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a listen now to the original demo of money, Roger Waters on vocals and guitar. <laughs> first here on 1FM, the original demo of Money, and then I thought I did a fairly tasteful but wrong crossfade. It's very, very slick. Very <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't slick at all. It was it's all anarchy, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, uh, into the, uh, the version from the CD. 1973. I mean, the thing that really dates it is not the, the sound, but some of Roger's lyrics there, you know, money's the root of all evil today. It's sort of mm. young and idealistic and slightly naff. Mm, well, yeah, I think he practice makes perfect. He got a bit better, I think. That was nice. Good idea, though. Well, my guest uh, live in the studio, as you uh, probably realise by now, is uh, Dave Gilmore of uh, the aforementioned Pink Floyd. And while we're talking of oldies, um, in fact, we're going to play uh, some other demos that you brought in, things like the demo of Comfortably Numb. Uh, we've got the dem a demo, or rather you singing like a rolling stone to a <laughs> reggae beat which is a hoot. Um, well, that's the sort of thing you get up to late at night in, a, <laughs> in your well, own we recording should, studio. We shall hear that a little I later. I shall probably regret my follies. But, but talking of oldies, there is a, a box set, I believe, that's coming out. You've been working on that today on the artwork and stuff. Yeah. So tell us about this box set. Um, it's uh, due to be released in October. Um, something the record companies have been asking us for, and we're putting out um, a selection of our albums, not, not all of them for some reason, best known to the record companies and, and price structures. 
Um, and yeah, we've been doing some a book for it, some new artwork, and uh, we've gone back to the very original master tapes, of which I've been digging out of vaults and things, um, to to remaster them to digital. Mm. I've basically been checking that all the tapes are the absolute original master recordings, and uh, going off to be mastered hopefully better than they've ever been done before. So when can we expect to see this box set in the shops? October, mm. I believe, sometime in October. Now, I mean, I, do, I don't want to sort of harp on this. Well, in fact, I do, because it's actually quite a good story. Um, the sort of problems that you had with Roger when Roger Waters left the band, I think, mm. is the phrase that we, that we use. Well, he did leave the band. Yeah. No, I wasn't being funny, I mean, but he, didn't. he did leave the band. He didn't. He, he jumped. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk about this a, a little bit. Certainly in relation then to... Then we shall. Good. Certainly... I love it. <laughs> love it. Certainly re in relation to this uh, box set. I mean, to bring out all the old Floyd stuff, presumably that's an elastic band, dear listener, um, you had to get Roger's permission. I mean, was that, was that easy? Cause to do you what? Got to bring out the box set. Uh, no, we're a, we are a, a company, and um, basically uh, we vote for shareholders, Rick, Nick myself and Roger and um, and this was something that Roger sort of agreed to anyway the basic concept of the box set it's um, something the record companies wanted and uh, they've you know made some other concessions towards us in, in return for it um, it's just when it got down to the deta details of it it uh, sort of changed a little bit so I mean are you guys still fighting because you went through court battles and solicitors where you spent no, any time Roger can think of something to fight us over, he threatens us with a lawsuit, but it never seemed to, seems to quite get to it. So, generally speaking, we kind of ignore it and hope it'll go away. So, what's he been fighting over with this box set? Oh, it's, it's too tedious, Nick. We don't want to go into all that rubbish. And yes, been, we do. He's, well, he's been arguing about who should be doing the artwork for it, and we've argued that Storm Ferguson should do it, who's of hypnosis. part of hypnosis, um, who's, been, who's done uh, most of the... Uh, the artwork for, for most of the albums that are going into the box set and Roger doesn't think that he should be doing the artwork for the box set um, to which we all disagreed and um, so it's turned into one of those silly arguments. Where don't, don't you think though that after all these years and the fact that you and Nick went out as Pink Floyd and you had momentary lapse of reason without Roger you went on the road for what, are you two years or something? Mm. Don't you think it's kind of like time to bury the hatchet? I mean, there's a lot of energy that's been expended on this, on this row between Roger and the two of you. Well, we only are expending defensive energy. You know, we're not involved in a in a battle to to cause Roger any harm or do any of that stuff. Um, he's the one who is forcing us to defend ourselves, and it gets tedious. It's been tedious for years. Mm. Um, but uh, I suppose it makes him happy, or, or makes him something. He was he was very unpleasant, actually, about momentary lapse of reason. Um, I thought he said it was quite a fair forgery or something, didn't Yes, he? quote, a very facile but quite clever forgery. Well, not very nice, isn't it? Really? As Mandy Rice Davis would say, well, he would, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> right, OK, well, we'll, uh, we'll move off the subject of Roger, although probably we'll, we will actually come back to him when we're talking about uh, lyrics. Can't wait. And we get in to talk about Sid and stuff like that. But um, when uh, we rang you up and we said, uh, you know, would you like to come in, uh, we asked you to fill out a little form, mm -hmm. the, uh, the BBC Radio 1 uh, form, uh, which is, please tell us about your favourite records, like the first record that you ever bought, uh, the record that makes you cry, the record that makes you dance. Um, you haven't actually uh, revealed to us uh, any record that makes you cry. No, um, and you only managed to persuade the others out of me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah. can't think of a record that makes me cry, to be honest with you. Um, I said one earlier on, I'd like to hear, just because I'd like to hear it. But uh, yeah, You said you that don't. what would make you cry would be listening to one of Roger Waters' records. So. Ah, yes, no, you, you were feeding words into my mouth, <laughs> I just give you the lines, it's okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so the first record that you ever bought, I have that lined up over here. Uh, Rock Around the Clock, it should be. It Bill is. Hay was the first one I ever bought when I was, I think I was 10. Mm. 1956, it should have been. Um, and it was on a 78, as singles were in those days, and our sort of nanny babysitter girl sat on it and broke it at some point, for which I never forgave her. Christine Bird, her name was. And here it is now. One, two... One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. 
9, 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, rock, we're going to... First record that my guest Dave Gilmore ever bought uh, on a 78, uh, Bill Haley on CD now, there's progress for you, and Rock Around the Clock. And between now and the time that uh, Dave leaves us, you'll hear a record that, uh, his favourite record that makes him laugh, and also his favourite love song, and also some more demos to come. And in fact, uh, a demo coming in about uh, four or five minutes, but first... I want to play you something, Dave, uh, which is an oldie, which you will recognise. Just going to play like a minute of it, and then I'm going to ask you a question. So first, have a listen. Quiz time. OK, the Beatles, of course, on one FM, and uh, Lucy in the Sky. Now, does that remind you, and I hope I've got this right, does that remind you in any way of Paris? No. Now, come on, don't give me a hard time. <laughs> Do you remember Starving in Paris? Yes, I remember Starving in Paris, yes. And listening to that record? I can remember listening to that, um, that album during that period. Actually, it was more... I, I listened to that record more when we were in the north of France somewhere, not actually in Paris, in a town called Etretat in 1967. And that's when that record came out I, as an album. I thought you sort of meant that particular track, but the no, whole, I'm, the whole, I meant I meant the experience, the, the whole experience. Mm. Yes. Well, t tell us about starving in Paris, because I mean, the number of times that, that we've talked, I mean, it's something that has never sort of cropped up in our in our previous encounters. I wish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dave is now standing up and showing us uh, his uh, what? Um, large S. Large S. Yes. Mm. Um, starving in Paris. We've yeah. never talked about this. I didn't realise that you were sort of down in your luck and, and literally sort of having to. Um, sort of steal I, bread and, and that kind of stuff just to survive uh, in a band. Well, I, I, I had I got an offer of a job in um, Marbella in the south of Spain in 1966, and I put together a band of friends who hadn't been my band before. One or two of them had been. We went down there for the summer, and we then went back to England. Then we got an offer of a job in Saint Etienne in France. I went down there for three months at the end of 66 and then we moved up to Paris in January 67 and stayed based in Paris moving all over France for most of the year of 1967. Who, sorry, who is we? Myself and this band that I was in. Right, okay. Yeah. And um, basically there were times during that period when you know we would have maybe a gig or two gigs a week on weekends and uh, we'd have borrowed money and by the time we'd got back to Paris and paid off our debts and had a meal that would that would cover the week, and the rest of the week would be a little sort of, um, food would be a little hard to come by. So how so did you survive? Oh, come when you're, when you're, I was 20 or 21, I was, it's, I was 20, and, um, you do, you survive. Did you, you, you have ways, there are ways when you're young and mm. doing that sort of thing of, of getting by, you know, it's... It's not what I'd, I'd sort of choose to do now. It eventually got, it eventually got too much, for me and my system. And I got uh, flu and flu and malnutrition and something else as well, and got dragged off to hospital. And, and I thought enough's enough, and but sidled off back to England. But you still, despite this sort of uh, this dreadful oh, it, time, tough. Tough, yeah, tough it time. Tough. But despite this tough time, you still, <laughs> you still decided that you wanted to pursue music as a career. Um, yes. Mm, of course. No doubt in your mind at all? Um... Didn't think you wanted to become an accountant or a doctor? Or I didn't really think I was going to be any good at anything else, and I wasn't even sure if I'd be any good at music, but as I'd come that far... Had you I been to university? I, no. no. O-levels or whatever they had? I got some O-levels, yes, yeah. one or two. Mm. I'd um, done A-level courses and stuff at uh, the Cambridge College of Arts and Technology, um, but quit just before, or quit actually during A-levels. Um, thought burning my bridges was the right way to go about things. Yes, not, well, it's not something I'd recommend to no, but with other people. But with the benefit children, of hindsight, of course. It seems to 2020 vision. My guest uh, live on uh, 1FM this evening on Into the Night is Dave Gilmore. It's 11 o'clock and in an hour's time, Bob Harris will be here Into the Night. Whispering now let's, Bob. Yes, Whispering Bob. He'll be down to say hello. Oh, said. great. Yes. Um, you brought in another demo, which we're going to play now. In fact, we're going to play probably two demos virtually back to back. This really isn't a demo. This is a, a kind of sound effect of um, a chap called Roger the Hat. 
Um, now, I actually have heard this before, but let's just explain, just before we play this little section, wh who Roger the Hat is and where this recording comes from, and then we'll mm. sort of go into the, the whys and wherefores after we hear it. Oh, Roger the Hat was one of the many sort of roadie people that uh, worked for us in, in that period of time. Um, we had him and another chap called Liverpool Bobby. They were great, and, and Roger the Hat professed to be Liverpool Bobby's manager. <laughs> and um, but what's happened during the making of Dark Side of the Moon was that we, uh, um, at, I think it must have been Roger's idea, wrote down all these questions on uh, pieces of paper and set them up on a music stand in the studio and put them in front of any people we could get it to sit in front of the microphone and uh, read the question then answer it, uh, then move the paper off somewhere else so that he could then see the next question. But you couldn't look through the questions before you answered them. You had to ask, answer each one consecutively without seeing what the following one was in order to get lots of what we would now call sound bites mm. for Dark Side of the Moon. And we had loads of people answer these questions. Paul, Paul and Linda McCartney answered them, but they were a bit too used to interview and that sort of technique and consequently didn't give very interesting answers. But... Um, Loads of other people did. Jerry, the Irish doorman at uh, Abbey Road Studios, um, um, and Roger the Roger the Hat, and mm. and Chris Adamson, another one of our roadies, and Puddy Watts, who was married to one of our roadies at the time, American girl, um, and all the voices that are heard on Dark Side of the Moon came from these question and answer sessions. Some some went on further than that. Right, like, well, in fact, like this one, because, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say, and I think we're sort of grown up to be able to say um, how this next piece of recording was obtained, because... Well, Roger, you the, remember it. I can't actually remember it. Well, because no, I, yeah. I, I heard that, that Nick played me years mm -hmm. ago, the, the long take, which is mm -hmm. Roger Waters interviewing Roger the Hat. And it's, it's obviously very late at night, and Roger the Hat has obviously been taking something, and he's on kind of a different planet... I don't think he had to, to be honest with you. No. <laughs> no, he was on another planet anyway. Okay, well, he was on another planet, but he was obviously very scared by Roger Waters, who was, uh, it wasn't just asking him questions, because it made the Spanish Inquisition look like, you know, the golden shot. I mean, mm. Roger was really pounding this guy, who was, who was actually not very strong. So let's mm. hear this kind of manic, you're, when you hear it, you will, you will know where it comes from. This is Roger the Hat, which eventually landed up on Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> Live for today, Conchabara, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the little sound effect that, as I say, eventually landed up on Dark Side of the Moon. But that manic laugh, I mean, the guy was... He was talking about death there. The yeah. question was about yeah. death. Yes, it was. Life and for today, gone tomorrow. Yeah. And he also did the other bit about uh, good manners don't cost nothing, do they? And but it was, it was an interesting technique. I mean, especially Water's technique mm. to actually break this poor man down and actually get him to laugh, but he's actually crying. Oh, he's very good at that, Rog. Thoroughly <laughs> skilled. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to another demo now, which, is, uh, which takes us away from Dark Side of the Moon and takes us into uh, The Wall, uh, era. It's the demo for Comfortably Numb, uh, which while we're lining it up, and we're just about to line it up, tell us where this came from, because this in fact comes from the Dark Side of the Moon time, doesn't it? No, no, Is that right? the, from the Comfortably Numb demo mm. uh, comes from when I was making my first solo album at uh, Super Bear Studio in the south of France, and um, it was after the band had gone home, and we were running out of time and money, and um, this is just something I wrote and plonked down on a little high-strung guitar one afternoon. Mm -hmm. 